بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله وكفاه والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى وعلى عباده الذين ارتضى ومن بهداه مهتدى وبآثار أهل المدينة اقتفى وبعد السلام الله عليكم uh, we're in session three today of Al-Andalus from rise to fall we took a look in the previous session at the conquest of Al-Andalusia, the Iberian Peninsula, um, how Tariq bin Ziyad had gone had gone into the Iberian Peninsula with huge, like, staggering success. What we're going to take a look at today is what follows on from that success. We will see, once again, the like a whole like succession of of amazing campaign we will also then see the advent of Musa ibn Nusayr this will all contribute to what is the aftermath if you like and we are seeing the sun rise on this Iberian Peninsula we will then begin to see the play of politics perhaps or at least political decisions which then once again start to redefine history as we know it. The role of the Caliphate, how certain instructions come into play, how the Khalifa at the time, Al-Walid ibn Abd al-Malik, all of a sudden starts to make certain decisions which change history as it could have been and make it into what it was and what we came to know it to be. We will then see this era, a new era, which is known as, in Arabic, Ahdul Wulat, the era of the governors or the era of governance. This particular era, how many years, 40 odd, about 42 years, this period of time lasts for. And we will take a look at that in a bit more detail, is where the sun continues to shine on the Iberian Peninsula. But then we start to see certain incidents and some times of turbulence befalling the peninsula. We will see success met with unfortunate tragedy. We will also hear a bit about some of the key characters who rose in, in these times, scoring certain victories once again, showing us what courage should be like uh, and how how a person's niya should be sincere in what they do. But towards the end, we will once again start to see perhaps the sun setting or, or what appears to be the sun setting on this peninsula, on the story of Islam within this region of the globe. Inshallah, da'na nabda, let's begin. That's for us in a bit, a bit of details, those of us who can see uh, the PowerPoint that what I've mentioned the successes, and the aftermath, the advent of Musa ibn Nusayr, Damascus, and how this plays a role, the new era, and also what I didn't go into, uh, what I didn't mention just as a highlight was the French frontiers, and how this plays a key role during this era. Then we will look at, as well, some cancerous elements which exist within within human societies, within human nature, these things have to be worked at or the, or, the re, or the consequences can be quite deadly and very severe. And then also we will look at this, the battle of um, Balat al-Shuhada, which is perhaps like uh, translated as the palace of the martyrs. And then f concluding with lessons that we can learn upon reflection. And Allah says, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ That we should remind that reminding each other or a remembrance is what benefits the believers. Where we had last left this lesson and this session was that Tariq ibn Ziyad had met a huge, uh, I mean he had a huge success, overall success at Wadi Birbat. He had moved on from there, gone to one of the one of the most fortified cities in Andalusia at the time, which was Seville, Ishbiliya in Arabic. Seville was a 
I mean, it was a massive city, relatively speaking, well fortified, and surprisingly, they actually decide to they decide not to go to war with the Muslims. They decide to have a settlement. They decide to resolve things in peace. They have what we call sulah. They agree to the jizya, and they open their doors to Tariq ibn Ziyad. An amazing success, really. So Tariq ibn Ziyad is... I mean, he's, abs he's overwhelmed by the successes, as are the Muslims with him. They decide to advance further north. They have the instructions. They continue to move on. There had been certain losses that the Muslims had faced at Wadi Birbat. If you recall, Tariq ibn Ziyad, including the reinforcements that were sent to him, had about 12,000 men with him. Amongst them, they, had a, they sustained a loss of almost 3,000 after the incident of Wadi Birbat. So now with 9,000 people, really, Tariq ibn Ziyad continues to advance north. He, from Seville, he moves on to a place which was known as Astudja. Once again, very good and amazing success. Neighboring towns, cities, villages, they start to, they start to open their doors to Tariq ibn Ziyad. The thing is that you see before Tariq ibn Ziyad had landed at Seville or had conquered Wadi Birbat, there were certain preconceptions that people had of what the armies would have done. They thought that the armies would ransack their cities, their towns, their villages, enslaving people, causing, leaving behind nothing but destruction. They began to see what the reality was, when they began to see how the Muslims had actually dealt with people, I mean, this took them by so much surprise that they were, many of them totally agreed to open their doors to, to the Muslim rulers because not only did they think that this, that, that, that this would be resolved peacefully, but they would be in a much better state than they currently were under the Visigoths. So this is extremely important to remember. And many people that question this can verify it through diverse sources that the Muslims, when they entered the Iberian Peninsula, there were not bloodbaths that ran. There were not massacres and just killing sprees and things like this that took place. Nothing of the sort took place like that. I'm not saying that every battle and war does not have Perhaps it's transgression, but I'm speaking on a on a scale relative to other wars and battles that have taken place throughout the globe. Tariq ibn Ziyad continues to advance. He goes to Qurtuba, Allahu Akbar. He actually sends a small regiment before him to Qurtuba, what we call in Arabic as Okay. How many people do you think he sends? And how many of us here? Of Al Qurtuba, I mean of Qurtuba. We everybody has heard of Qurtuba. Qurtuba today, it was a it was to become a city that would rival Baghdad of the East. Allahu Akbar, a city that would bring forth legends like Ibn Abd al Bar, like Ibn Hazm. That would have a city that would boast of its ulama and its tradition. This, everybody has heard of Al-Qurtaba. It at one point will, will host the largest masjid on earth. This city, Qurtaba, was, was liberated and conquered by just 700 people. That's all Tariq ibn Ziyad was doing. He was sending several small Saraya, small Saraya, each one consisting of 700 people. He sent one, he sent him to many places, Murcia, he sent it to Jiyan, he sent him to all these surrounding areas and, and met with success upon success. Allahu Akbar. See, when Allah gives, <laughs> Ya Salam, He gives unimaginably. And Allah was enabling these people to open always for light, 
for the light of Iman and Islam to shine through and rid them of their oppression. And that's what these people were doing. They were welcoming what they were finding to be Al-Islam. And many people were embracing the fold of Islam. Many people were. And remember, Muslims always gave the option. They gave the option of three. They gave them the option to embrace Islam, or they and in that and they would keep all their possessions and everything would remain as it is. They gave them the option that okay, you don't embrace Islam, you are just prepared to pay the jizya. And we did discuss the jizya briefly in in the previous sessions. The jizya would tantum would be less than the zakat of usual Muslims. Jizya quite often, especially at that time, was estimated to be around one dinar annually. One dinar in a year. And, the, and remember, women were exempt. Children were exempt. Slaves were exempt. Those with disability like blindness and those who could not earn were, ex, were, ex, were exempt. Those who were committed to worship like monks, Christian monks, etc., were exempt. All of these things that I'm saying can be verified through diverse sources. So this isn't something I'm not trying to present like a very fairy tale version of the of Islamic history. This is how things unfolded. I mean, whether people like them or they love them, this is how it was. So. This is why town after town, village after village, people were openly embracing the deen of Al-Islam. Now, the thing was, previously, and what continued to be at this time, the capital of Andalusia was Toledo, Toleta, Toleta, one of the most fortified cities in Andalusia due to its mountainous terrain. It was one of those cities that people... Whoever had it had an extremely important vantage point. And it was something almost unconquerable. Almost. Now the Muslims, Tariq ibn Ziyad saw that Tulaytala was ahead of him. So he thinks, why not? Let's proceed. Let's. We've got the momentum. Every, I mean, the people have got such high morale. The spirits are high success after success let's advance there was a little problem however the overall commander the wily of north africa who was governing the armies of north africa and he was the one who had instructed tariq ibn ziyad and put him in command he had actually commanded tariq ibn ziyad not to go beyond qurtuba or jihan but the thing was now tariq ibn ziyad had to make a call he was at a strategic position. He saw that he was meeting success upon success. He saw that villages, towns, cities were opening their doors. He had two options ahead of him. Either he stops, halts the forces, he goes back, sends back a request to Musa ibn Nusayr, this could take months before it reaches North Africa and then comes back with a permission to advance north. Or, while well, he's doing something good anyway, will send the request and or rather the notification back to Musa ibn Musaid, but we can continue with the morale, with the momentum, we go forth. I mean, people are, I mean, what else could be greater than more and more people entering into the fold of Islam and at the same time opening to this new to this new rule, to this new way of life. So he thinks to himself, well, what do I do? I've got to make a call. His armies are looking at him. They're saying to him, well, what do we do? He thinks, he looks, and he makes his call. He says, let's march straight ahead to Toledo, to Toledo. And that's exactly what he does. He goes to Tulaytala. Tulaytala is one of the most fortified places, as I've explained before. They surround, they lay siege to this fort. Now it is 
it's a difficult place but at the same time people are now aware of how muslims are treating people during this time whilst he lays whilst him Tariq ibn Ziyad and his army have laid siege at Tulaytala the news has reached Musa ibn Nusayr that Tariq had decided to go ahead now in all fairness this had upset and disappointed Musa ibn Nusayr he thinks that look this isn't right this isn't what I had said a chain of command is there for a reason so he gets his army and Meanwhile, I mean, what Tariq ibn Ziyad was unaware of was that Musa ibn Nusayr had been raising and assembling an army regard, I mean, unaware of the situation come to Al-Andalus. Whilst this news reaches him that Tariq ibn Ziyad had actually decided to go further north and not stop where you had told him to stop. By that time, Musa ibn Nusayr had gathered the army. He had actually asked and sought reinforcements from from what was Yemen, from the headquarters, which was at, uh, Damascus and Syria at the time. So he had many Syrian people come over, many Yemen, Yemeni tribes. He had almost an army of 18,000 people. And remember, the initial conquest was only with 12,000. So with an army of 18,000, he crosses over into the Iberian Peninsula. Only to... And May I, at this point, I'd like to say, people have said, what was Musa's problem with Tariq advancing north? People have said that his problem was that he didn't want Tariq to become too popular. He didn't want him to um, get too much power. There was elements of jealousy involved. All these things some people have thrown up there, Gen especially um, Orientalists and other people who have studied Islamic history from a non-Muslim perspective. We are not denying that human nature may play a role. However, we go with what generally the understanding we go with the understanding that has been presented through the seerah, the life of Musa ibn Nusayr. See, Musa ibn Nusayr was a legend in his own right. He was somebody that had, I mean, he had, was prepared to sacrifice his own life in the sake, for the sake of Allah. Somebody that had gone out far and wide, jeopardized his, his own life, his family, his... You know, he could have lived a very reasonable life, just staying where he was, secure, with, with safety, with wealth, with so on and so forth in North Africa. Yet he was somebody that went on venture up, fo upon venture following venture. Why? Just so he could ensure Nashr al-Da'wah, that this da'wah could reach people. We do believe that he had a sincere intention. He had told Tariq ibn Ziyad that he had feared. Now, if you remember from the history of, Tariq, of Musa ibn Nusayr, he was somebody that secured North Africa following the conquests of Uqba ibn Nafi, the great Sahabi. And what was it? What was it that made that kind of eclipse the successes or the success of Uqba ibn Nafi? If you remember, Uqba ibn Nafi had conquered. North Africa within months. What was the problem that followed? If you recall, it was rebellion, apostasy. It was that when things are done in haste, they are often met with failure. He had told Tariq ibn Ziyad that, look, we do not want to repeat this mistake in the Iberian Peninsula. Do not just go from city to city to town to town when you go to a place and he has been liberated, you set it up. You bring in people who will teach those people the deen. You establish that city as a city of light before you decide to move forward. Do not just go from town to town to town. To town. These things will fall back upon you almost like a row of dominoes. That's what we will see. He had warned 
Tariq ibn Ziyad of this. Now, when he heard of Tariq ibn Ziyad advancing and his, he had assembled an army with prior intentions regardless, he advanced upon the Iberian Peninsula. Now, when he did, one of the, th the first things he was met with, Allahu Akbar, that Seville, Ishbiliya, which Tariq ibn Ziyad, which had opened its doors to Tariq ibn Ziyad, and he had, he had liberated it, conquered it, and moved forward, moved north, had actually rebelled. And they had rebelled quite fiercely. Now, Musa ibn Nusayr brings his armies, they lay siege, I mean, they laid siege, they surrounded Ishbiliya, they were there for a while, and for months, I don't, I don't just mean a, f a few days or a few weeks, for months they were there. They negotiated, and eventually they got through into Ishbiliya. Whilst Musa ibn Nusayr was there, Tariq ibn Ziyad had heard that Ishbiliya, that Ishbiliya had rebelled. So he got his armies from Tulaytala, from Toledo, and he set back south, went back upon his trail, only to be met with the armies of Musa ibn Nusayr, who had beat him to it. Allahu Akbar. Wastabiqul khayrat. That race and compete with one another in those actions which are good. When he got there, he saw Musa ibn Nusayr, and Musa ibn Nusayr had instructed saying that take your army and go back to Tulaytala and wait in Tulaytala for my command. Wait for me. And then Allahu Akbar. Musa ibn Nusayr taking the people with him heads westward. And what is in the west? What is in the west is modern day Portugal. He heads into towns, cities like Baja. He conquers Baja. He heads and surrounding small towns, conquers them with sweeping success. He heads to a place which was one of the most fortified places at the time known as Marda. It was an absolute Gothic fort, a fort of the Goths, the Visigoth kingdom. And the Muslims try... And they try and they laid siege and attempt following attempt. But no, they were only met with failure every single time. Allahu Akbar. But did this put them down? Did this put them down? No. These people, people who had a covenant with Allah, they knew that success was destined. It's as the poet says, he says, Masaib se ulajkar muskurana meri fitrat hai. Mujhe nakamiyon ke boj se dabna nahi aata. He says, when I am met with calamities, all I can do is smile. He says, to sink with the burden of failure is something I do not know how to do. They try and try and then eventually they come up with an idea, this a new tactic at the time known as the Baba, this thing. They create this thing called the Baba, which I know in modern day Arabic they refer to a, a tank, a military tank as the Baba. But in its time it was this thing which the Muslims kind of, it was like a tank which they got into which couldn't be burnt by what it was. They had some type of fire resistant coating to it. And it could roll. And what they did is they took this right up to the fort. And when people would attempt to set fire to it, it was fire resistant. And people from within this tank began to hack away at the fort and attempted to create an entrance. Now, this was one of their major attempts, although it was partially successful, yet many of the people within the fort 
when they began to realize what the Dababa was doing, they they resorted to things like raising heavy rocks and dropping rocks and so on and so forth. Yet, Musa ibn Nusayr continues to stand strong with his people. Allahu Akbar. And they lay... When the people of Marida saw the resilience, they saw the resilience that these people had and how Allah, how are Muslims described by their adversaries? They are described as people so warman, or they used to say, Fursanam bin Nahar, Rahbanam bil People who were like monks at night stood in prayer. And like knights and warriors during the day. People with such resilience that you would think, Allahu Akbar, that, that were these mountains that stood before you. And with such determination, with such might in their hearts, when the people of Marda saw this, they began to lose hope or began to lose their determination to resist. Ramadan had come upon the Muslims, Allahu Akbar. Ramadan following Ramadan, if you remember, the previous year it was Ramadan when the Muslims had entered Wadi Birbat. And it has been an, an entire year and it is Ramadan again. How did Muslims spend their Ramadan? Not Sleeping, doing this, doing that, lazing, I can't do this, I can't learn, I can't do anything. But rather going from difficulty to difficulty. And on the day of Eid, the people of Marda opened their doors with a treaty. And the Muslims agreed to that treaty. And Allahu Akbar, Marda, the keys to Marda was handed over to Musa ibn Nusayr. So the Muslims not only celebrated Eid al-Fitr, but they celebrated for the success that they had achieved at Marda. Then following that, once again Musa ibn Nusayr returns to Seville. He secures Seville. There's a surrounding, there's a town not too far from there known as Labla. He secures Labla, liberates it. And then there's another town and which is known as Talabira, which is close to Tolaitala, to Toledo. And he heads to Talabira and once again liberates this town and city as well. And he calls Tariq ibn Ziyad to that town. And Allahu Akbar, the two legends meet. They meet and it has been, it has been over a year since they last met. In fact, almost two years, because at Wadi Birbat, he was not accompanied by Musa ibn Nusayr, Tariq ibn Ziyad wasn't. He had been instructed by him almost a year before. It has been almost two years since they meet face to face. And here some of the non-Muslim historians, the Orientalists, write about how he, tried, he punished Tariq ibn Ziyad, or even he had him whipped, or he did this, or he did that. And none of these stories have been authenticated. What we do know is they did discuss. And yes, he did reprimand Tariq ibn Ziyad for what he did. He told him that, look, I did warn you that these people behind you will rebel. And Tariq ibn Ziyad accepted his mistake. And many things are often done in passion. And his passion from his perspective was justified. And from there they head north together. They rode together leading what Tariq ibn, what Musa ibn Nusayr had brought with him. And yes, he had sustained many losses as well. But they combined forces and head and they set off together. This joint venture of theirs took them to Barcelona. Barcelona. Which then came into the light of Islam. Barcelona being ruled and having Muslim judgments. And Islam being taught there. Ulama being present. People, do you know how 
old or the age of Musa ibn Nusayr is at this point. He was 75 years of age. We're not talking about a child or a teenager or somebody in his 40s. or 50. 75 years of age. Where are we today when we reach that age? Where are we when we reach anything close to that age? Where are people when they reach 60? We give up on life. We give up on dreams. We give up on hopes, on ambitions. We see no purpose. People are often confronted with the meaning of life, especially when they reach, when they reach a later age. But this is a meaning that all that wisdom a person has attained throughout life, to share that with the generations that have come after them, to enlighten those who have come after you. This is the tradition of Al-Islam. So at such an age, they continue, Saragosa, or in Arabic, Saragusta, a large, a huge part of northeast Spain they conquer. They head north to the French frontiers. The Pyrenees mountain, Allahu Akbar, they go beyond them, bring them into the light of Al-Islam. There is a city in southern France known as Arbuna. They conquer that. Musa ibn Nusayr has his son Abdul Aziz with him who he sends westwards. So what into what would be modern day Portugal into those regions to secure and ensure stability and that is what they are doing and we are seeing the sun rising it has gone beyond rising it is almost at its zenith at the meridian we can see the sun is high it is at noon Allahu Akbar it is daylight in the Iberian Peninsula when all of a sudden something strange takes place. Allahu Akbar. Musa ibn Nusayr is approached by a person who hands him a message, a royal decree. In other words, he gets a very important text message, if you like. He, he takes a look at this message, this decree, and it is by Walid ibn Abd al-Malik the Khalifa of the Muslims, who tells him and commands him, tells him to stop advancing and not only to stop advancing, but commands him and Tariq ibn Ziyad to immediately, he summons them immediately to Damascus. Allahu Akbar. Now remember, the chain of command is important. And Allah has taught us, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul wa ulil amri minkum. And those who had been given that command. And here, Tariq ibn Ziyad with Musa ibn Nusayr, they make this detour. They stop and they go back, and they head towards Damascus, a journey which could take them months before they arrive at the Damascus courts. This period of time that they had spent in conquest almost lasted three and a half years, in which almost the entire Iberian Peninsula, except the northwest part of Spain, a small region which was known as a Sakhra at the time, which means a rock, but a Sakhra Balai, and that was after a particular kingdom that was there, remains unconquered. Everything else has entered the fold of Al-Islam. When the two, Musa ibn Nusayr, Musa and Tariq actually reach Damascus, subhanAllah, they find Walid ibn Abd al-Malik is on his deathbed. In fact, within three days, he dies. Ya Salah. Ya Salah. What a decision. People have said that the reason he brought them back 
some people once again have casted the element or the doubt of insecurity, the fact that they were getting way too powerful, the fact that he could no longer control them and Musa ibn Nusayr was already in charge of North Africa. If he was to conquer Europe, what would become of Walid ibn Abd al-Malik himself? Because Musa would be in charge of a territory double that of the territory of Walid ibn Abd al-Malik. Some people have said that. Some people have said that this was a political decision, really one led by the greed for power. Allahu a'lam what the reality of the situation is. We do know that one of the reasons that Walid and the Umayyin justified this withdrawal was that they said they came to realize of Musa ibn Nusayr's Musa ibn Nusayr's intentions and that was to continue until he had conquered Europe and through Europe he attempted to reach Constantinople these intentions Musa ibn Nusayr declares later on and accepts these were his intentions and he believes them to be very good and noble intentions and this was something that the Khalifa had said was that too risky of a task or a venture to embark upon. He said that they were way too far for reinforcements from the Muslim kingdoms, that everything would implode upon itself, that the, this would lead to huge loss of Muslim armies and Muslim Muslims in foreign lands. And therefore he had summoned the two back to Damascus. After Walid ibn Abd al-Malik, he was succeeded by his brother Suleiman ibn Abd al-Malik. Somebody who likewise didn't last too long in the, in the Khilafah post. However, he, him, he also continued upon the policy of his brother Walid and refused to let Musa return to the Iberian Peninsula. Allahu Akbar. Such momentum was brought to a stop. Confusion is what follows. What Suleiman does is he appoints Musa's son Abdul Aziz, who was, if you remember, heading westwards and sustain or kind of stabilizing the western region of the Iberian Peninsula. He makes him in charge, he makes him the wali, a governor. That means you're in charge, but you're directly below. You're not below the governor of North Africa. You're directly below the Khalifa, Suleiman himself. This gives rise to a new era known as the era of governance. However, Musa at the time continues to insist that he be allowed to return to the Iberian Peninsula. Each request of his was refused. Yes, Allah, I mean, what was actually going on? Whether the people at the time, whether Bani Umayyah, those in charge, Suleiman, actually knew how his decisions would impact history to come. Allahu A'lam, I mean, perhaps many of us never are quite so sure what subtle decisions can have huge consequences those of us familiar with the butterfly effect are you know absolutely aware of how these things sometimes unfold in history a poet had actually said uh, describing some of the circumstances of bani umayyah he had actually said ara tahta ramadi wa midu narin wa yushiku an yakuna laha diramu فَإِنَّ النَّارَ بِالْعُودَيْنِ تَذْكُوا وَإِنَّ الْحَرْبَ أَوَّلَهَا كَلَامُ فَإِنْ لَمْ يُطْفِهَا أُقَلَاءُ قَوْمِ يَكُونُ وَقُودُهَا جُثَثٌ وِهَامُ فَقُلْتُ مِنَ التَّعَجُّبِ لَيْتَ شِعْرِ أَأَيْقَاذٌ أُمَيَّةُ أَمْنِيَامُ He said that I see that fire sometimes beneath it remains a spark which is alive 
and it is fearful that this spark may turn into a fire. He says, how often is it that two twigs suffice in creating a fire? And how often is it that war is the result of simple words which have been uttered? He says that if this fire is not extinguished by those people of sense amongst my people, he says, I fear that it will result in piles of corpses. He says, I stand in amazement, like I scratch my head almost in amazement, that what has come, what has become of Umayyah, of Bani Umayyah, are they asleep? Or are they awake? Allahu Akbar. We are left with this new era of governance. Musa ibn Nusayr, after being refused time after time, he had almost, he had aged quite a bit by this point. And he thinks to himself, well, if I cannot return, then I would like to go, I mean, he actually wishes to himself, and what has been transmitted is a dua that Musa ibn Nusayr makes, where the season of Hajj was approaching. And he asks the Khalifa that, can I go at least to do Hajj? Because he was restricted to stay in Damascus. So the Khalifa allows him, he says, yeah, yeah, I mean, go for Hajj, there's no problem in that. And Musa ibn Nusayr makes a dua that he asks Allah that, Ya Allah, if you have willed for me to return to the land of Al-Andalus, where liberation and conquests are taking place, then do so. And if you have not willed and decreed that for me, then let my life come to an end in the city of your beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, al madinatul Manawwara. And Allahu Akbar. Allah says in the Quran, Udu'uni astajib lakum. That pray to me, call to me. I, Allah mentions, will respond to your du'as. And that is exactly what happens. Musa ibn Sayyid goes to Hajj and his life comes to an end in Madinatul Munawwara where he is buried. Tariq ibn Ziyad disappears amongst the confusion and politics or the era which had befell the Muslims and Allahu Akbar is nowhere to be heard of. Some people say that he managed to return to Al-Andalus and somehow that is where he met his fate within a few years. Others say no, he remained within Damascus and died within the ensuing years. A young at a young age what we do know is he disappears Allahu Akbar a legend a legend whose name we today recall but how his end his demise is completely unknown to people he disappears just almost within a cloud of obscurity there's a very famous poet, subcontinental poet Mir, who says in a poem, he says, Marte hai Mir sab pe na is pe kasi ke saath, matam pe tere koi na roya pukar ke. He says that death comes to each and all Mir, he addresses himself Mir, he says, yet, but not with such tragedy. He says that on your funeral, not one person cried out with your name. Meaning you had such a unknown funeral. But this is fate and this is qadr wal qada. This is what Allah writes for people. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ And no soul shall know in which land it shall die. But yet Allah has eternalized these people throughout history. We return from Damascus. We go several, several thousand miles to the west. We have to go to see 
what is taking place in the Iberian Peninsula. Abdul Aziz continues his conquests. He has gone so far west that he has conquered Lisbon. He has, which is in Arabic known as Lashbuna. He continues to go north. He has um, conquered all the surrounding towns. He himself was actually, he marries the wife or the widow of Ludric, King Roderick, if you remember, or Rodrigo. And this was quite a common practice that took place. Also, the large armies that, the Muslim armies which had entered the Iberian Peninsula, many of them were people who had come from the, come from the east, from Yemen, from Syria. Many of these people were not married. So one of the things that they did in the Iberian Peninsula was that they intermarried with the indigenous people of Spain. This led to a whole new generation of what historians call the Mawalladin, the mixed race generation. And there was a huge generation of them, including those people who were embracing Islam indigenously, but yet there were also the mixed race Mawalladin. Muslims at the time, you see, a question has been asked that why was it that rebellions didn't take place at this time? And that is because Muslim treatment was actually archetypal. I mean, it was something so amazing. Muslims purchased buildings, they purchased places of worship if they were for sale. They didn't just they didn't just rob the people of their churches and things like that. And this, by the way, people keep in mind as a mental note. We will contrast this when we reach the conquest of Granada by Ferdinand and Isabella and how the Muslim masjids are treated in contrast. Yet Muslims here bought churches, they invested in the construction, in the rejuvenation, they set up artillery depots. One of the things they set up were factories to manufacture ships because they realized that that was a weakness. They, they actually invested in the spread of the Arabic language, in teaching the language to people. Qurtuba was made a center of attention and became the capital of Muslim Spain. His previously the capital of Visigoth Spain was Toledo, Toledo, which was a bit further north, and Muslims brought it further south into Portoba, which was closer to North Africa, so if they required uh, reinforcements or backup, Muslim lands were never too far away. At this time, um, Abdul Aziz ibn Musa passes away, he dies, and he is followed by another governor, and then he is followed. So this era of governance begins. Okay, During this era of governance, people, there are two key eras. I want us to know that. We will split them into part one and part two. The whole era lasts for 42 years, during which there are actually 22 different governors. Now, we will not go through these governors. Um, we will just mention key people where it is necessary. But there are two parts to this. One which, in which we continue to see the sun shine upon the Iberian Peninsula where success is followed by success, and the latter part where we will see tragedy. Okay, so we will today focus on the first part of this era of governance. Some people ask, why were there 22 different governors? Partially, I mean, I mean, partly the answer to that is that initially during a lot of these conquests, many governors were always at the forefront on the battlefields, and that's where they met their fate, and that's why they were replaced by following governors. One of the leading governors that we see in the beginning is Samah ibn Malik al Khawlani. What he does is he is appointed by Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the legendary Khalifa from the east, from Damascus. He goes and he is instructed to invest. So he invests in Qurtuba. He is the one who makes Qurtuba the capital. He actually builds one of one of the most outstanding bridges that was ever to be raised in Qurtuba. In fact, in the Iberian Peninsula, 
It was known as Qantara Qurtuba, and it was something at the time which they describe had many type of it had many type of arches to it. It was something which was also accompanied by a dam, and it had four mills which were associated with it. So the mills would kind of work at kind of uh, producing wheat and barley and things like this. And at the same time, there was this huge br bridge, which was actually a covered, a shaded bridge. It wasn't just like a bridge which you crossed. It was actually like you're going through almost a subway bridge. Okay, so this is what was going on. At the same time, Samah continues to advance north. He goes into the French frontiers. If you remember, there was a town where Musa and Tariq had kind of conquered, known as Arbuna. He goes to that, reinforces it, stabilizes it, and then continues into the southwest of, of France. He reaches the French Rivera. Okay, that actually enters the light of Al-Islam. It is part of Muslim territory. French River, the actual coastal uh, line, which is a popular and extremely popular, um, ter uh, extremely popular type of a resort today, used for tourism and things like this. And anybody, I mean, you can all Google it, or you perhaps know of it. This was actually a Muslim uh, region during this time, where Islam is being taught and masajid are being set up, and Muslims are practicing Islam. One of the things he also does, Samah, is he organizes the different districts into what you have as regions or districts and cities so, and villages. So several villages become, um, they, they, they are linked to cities and cities are then linked to districts and he organizes them in this manner. That is what he does. At this time, the French kingdom is obviously is aware of this advance, this Muslim advance that is taking place. There is a person by the name of, in the Arabic uh, tradition, they call him Odis. I'm not sure what his French correlate name was, but he abandons the place where he was and leaves it to his territory to the Muslims. And he goes to, uh, to King Charles at the time, known as King Charles Martel. Now, Charles, who's aware of this, refers this matter to the Pope of the day and age. And the Pope declares this to be an immediate, a major threat for Christendom. And he declares this a holy war. He gives uh, King Charles the name Martel, which means a, uh, a hammer. In Arabic, they call him Mitraqa. And he and he kind of issues a decree throughout Europe that they should all send reinforcements and an army to kings to King Charles Martel. And that's exactly what they do. During this time, um, Samah ibn uh, Malik al-Khawlani passes away. He is followed by a person called Abdurrahman Ghafiqi. And we have to remember Ghafiqi, who, although is followed, but is then suspended. And in his place, somebody else is put there. And this person by the name of Ambasa ibn Suhaim, who, who rules for about between 103 to 107 Hijri. Once again, southwest Spain, he is, he, uh, southwest France, sorry, he, has, he stabilizes. He continues to advance north. He reaches a place known as Sants which is actually 30 kilometers away from Paris. And those of you who are aware of the French map or the map of France, you know that Paris is not in the south or in the center of France. It is actually quite north. Almost 70% of French territory was under the Iberian Islamic Peninsula at this time was under Muslim rule. Right. That, that is how far and wide it had actually reached. By this time, uh, this governor passes away, Ambasa, he passes away, once again a great governor, and is followed by a governor known as Haytham al-Kulabi.
Nahaytham al Kulabi, this is where some problems, we start to see symptoms of a deep rooted cancer. Haytham al Kulabi starts to allow issues like discrimination and racism to arise. He was very passionate about his own tribe, which was Bani Qais. And what he starts to do is give them favorable positions. He starts to discriminate against some of the, Ber the Berbers who were leading contributors to the success which had been achieved in Andalus. He starts to, let alone the Berbers and the Arabs, he starts to discriminate against other Arab tribes. He doesn't rule that long. He only rules for approximately about 10 months. But in his time, he allows so much fitan to arise Allahu Akbar. And this is the thing with fitna. Allah says in the Quran, wal fitnatu ashaddu min al qatl. The fitna is so bad, it is worse than murder. Because fitna can lead to massacre, it can lead to the downfall of civilizations. So during this time, all these things arise. So what happens is we start to see the sun which had risen and was shining gloriously over Andalus begin to set. We start to see that the daylight is losing its glory. Is this a time for despair? Yet yeah, Allah teaches us Wala taqnatu, that we should not despair. Okay? And then that we should not we should never ever give up hope from the mercy of Allah. Once again we see Ghafiqi, this name we'd heard before, Abdurrahman al Ghafiqi, rise. He returns to governance. Somebody who believes in hope. He believes in the promise and the covenant between the creation and the creator. And he stabilizes, he attempts, he starts to once again reinforce the teachings of Al-Islam. You see, remember these issues of racism and discrimination and hatred have been going on for, I mean, since time immemorial. Even during, we see it emerge sometimes during the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yet they have the best of creation amongst them, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there to quickly extinguish this fire of hatred. You see that even when the issue which occurs, the famous story between Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari and Bilal, when he discriminates against him and Bilal complains to the Prophet ﷺ that he called me Yabna Sauda, the son of a, a black woman. And the Prophet ﷺ reprimands Abu Dhar severely. He says to him that, Ya Abu Dhar, he says, Inna kamra'un fika jahiliya. That you are a person who still is plagued by jahiliya within your heart. Abu Dhar is so struck by the words of the messenger that he actually puts his face to the ground, to the soil, asks, begs Bilal to, to he says, put your feet over my face. Just, just kind of do this, that make me, forgive me for what I have said. Get even with me. Bilal says, I refuse to do such a thing, but I forgive you for the sake of Allah. Now, remember, these things have always attempted to surface time to time. And we see it, we see that these attempts had been made again. Abdurrahman al Ghafiqi goes and once again reinforces the teachings of Al Islam. Where Allah teaches us, وَاَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا That hold on together to the rope of Allah. Allah reminds us that He is the one who united between the hearts of the believers. 
وإذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا and you became by the grace of Allah believing brothers so he goes again he reinforces this teaching the the sermon of the prophet the guidelines that nobody not an Arab is better than a non-Arab and no vice versa not a black is better than a white and no is a white better than a black person illa bit taqwa except by by taqwa by god consciousness and we see that once again he attempts to stabilize and he heads north into the french frontiers he gets together an army of unprecedented history he raises an army 50000 strong allahu akbar and they head north into France once again stabilizing the territory that was there and remember almost 70 percent had been conquered he heads eastwards he takes certain towns and towns known as Iqtania, Abal he heads back into Maine or southern France or western France he conquers Bordeaux which is still today known as Bordeaux. He moves towards a town known as Tor. Then he goes to a region known as Poi, 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 uh, which they call Poitiers. They call it Poitiers. And he stabilizes that region. Allahu Akbar. Every single town they go to, there is nothing but success upon success. And wherever they are met with battle they are fall wherever they are met with battle they are then subsequently met with huge spoils of war huge trophies huge amount amounts of wealth that these armies are now carrying with them and it is often human nature that the hearts of people will sway with wealth so when these armies begin to conquer us and they seem to attain such huge spoils of war, this, does, this begins to cause problems amidst or amongst the ranks of the Muslim armies. Allah teaches us, وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا And there are those amongst you who want the dunya. وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ And there are those who seek the akhirah people once again arguments begin to arise discrimination issues some people start to say we should head back um, maybe we should go back and allow you know put back some of this wealth and then come back abdul rahman al ghafiqi reminds his people we are here for a reason and we should continue they reach this place known as shatil row uh, it is really, I mean, it still comes under really the town of Poitiers or Poitiers. And there is a palace, a, a kind of abandoned palace, which is known as Balat. At this point, Abdul Rahman Ghafiqi hears that Charles Martel is heading south with an army 400 thousand strong Allahu Akbar now Abdul Rahman Ghafiqi sets up his camp at this palace he, f he strategizes gets his people together and the two armies collide now, the Muslims had been the largest they had ever been. 50,000 on the Iberian Peninsula as a force, as an army, that is. Yet, they are heavily outnumbered. But it's not the outnumbering which frightens them. They actually stand their ground. And the battle continues for days. It continues. I'm not talking about a few days it goes on. It's over a week, almost two weeks long, almost, the battle. 
during this what we begin to see during all of this what we begin to see is that the Christians many of the Christian armies be, become aware of the huge wealth which the Muslim armies have brought with them so they decide to raid the the wealth that the Muslim armies are carrying and that strategy actually by extension works much greater in their favor because when they ransack the spoils of war which the Muslims are carrying this causes many of the many of the people many of the Muslims to say that were there at the time to say that wait a minute these guys are taking away our wealth we need to we need to you know race after them we need to worry about our wealth maybe what we've got we should take back what it does is it hacks away at the resolution and the determination in the hearts of the people present this people is what leads to a huge tragedy which follows the tragedy of balat ash-shuhada many many thousands of muslims are then massacred at this balat ash-shuhada because of the confusion which arose and allahu akbar it's as though we are seeing the battle of uhud once again surface throughout history and people and just re remind us that history does repeat itself during this during this battle and massacre abdul rahman al ghafiqi is martyred now during nightfall when the battle stops the muslims they decide that we are not in a position to sustain our ground we should retreat and that is what they do they do it in such a way that they set up their camps to look as though they are still holding their fort and they retreat overnight the following morning uh, when the army of king charles martel actually look they are faced with just an empty settlement the muslims had actually left the ground and disappeared what the army of king charles do is they rush and race after the muslim armies in their trail in their in trace of what they had actually what they had actually conquered and what they were leaving behind so town after town which had previously been stabilized under islam was now falling in this high momentum of backtrack that the muslim armies were doing and which was being faced or being chased by the armies of king charles and that's what they do right through to southern france allahu akbar we see that the entire french territory is lost the entire french territory right up until right up until the pyrenees mountains they chase them out they reconquer and capture any spoils of war or wealth that they can do so in the process one thing they did not do was follow them into the iberian peninsula they did not follow the muslim armies into spain they were happy that the muslims had kind of left the french territory and they were content to return with that success the muslims what they then do is fortify and stabilize the iberian peninsula we do see some further attempts by some people by some of the governors to at least stabilize what they do have and this is what leads us into the second part of the era of governance we no longer the sun is shining with its glory but rather it is beginning to set where we start to see an era where corruption 
begins to surface. We begin to see an era where discrimination begins to lead, where ruler be, where a ruler is assassinated by another. A governor is assassinated by another to become to take his place. We start to see that asabiya and racial discrimination and infighting begins to reach its peak. Allahu Akbar. We begin to see a point where for several years a decay and a cancer begins to engulf this entire Iberian Peninsula. A point where perhaps Islam is about to disappear. Where historians had said, give another decade to this Iberian Peninsula and there would not be a trace of Islam. You see, there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that he says, Mal faqra akhsha alaykum. He said, it is not poverty which I fear for you. He said, Walakin akhsha alaykum and Walakin akhsha and tubsatu dunya alaykum. But I open, but I fear that the world will be opened before you. Kama busitat ala man kana qablakum. As it had been opened and unfolded for kingdoms who came before you. فَتُهْلِكَكُمْ كَمَا أَهْلَكَتُمْ And then that it destroys you as it destroyed those who, before you, who went before you. Sometimes decisions and achievements where they leave us. Allahu Akbar. Sometimes certain actions which we do out of whether it be passion or whether it be revenge or emotion is a better word. What we do out of emotion without foresight, little do we know that this will echo in history to come. There is a poet who says, there's an Urdu poem, where he, he, speaking of such circumstances, he says, Muddat se ti kisi se milne ki arzu, khwaish didar me sab kuch gawa diya. Kisi ne di khabar ke wo aayega raat ko, itna kiya ujala ke ghar tak jala diya. He speaks about this type of passion where and it's obviously allegorical in the sense that where he wanted to meet somebody to the extent that somebody said they will come by nightfall. He says, I lit up the place so much that I actually burnt my house down. And these things, they teach us lessons. And Allah reminds us, take heed from those who went before you. There are many lessons we can learn from what took place at Balat al-Shuhada. There are many lessons we can learn through this era of conquest. What is known as Ahd al and the ensuing era known as Ahd al the era of governance. But then Allahu Akbar, as Allah says in the Qur'an, Allah, he speaks of his sunnah وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا That you will not find that Allah changes his laws His laws of nature, his laws of doing things That just when everything is in despair When everything is almost heading towards destruction Once again, Allah decides and decrees that a man single-handedly should land on this peninsula to change the history of Muslims and the entire peninsula and region for time to come. 
Who is that person? What is his tale? Is something that we shall take a look at in the following session. Jazakumullah al khair for listening attentively. Inshallah, leave us with this for today and I'll see us all next lesson. Do remember me if you can in your humble du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.